today is to try to open up and help you understand the results that you got from your tests. Uh, because for, for maybe, for some of you, it's maybe new, a new experience to, to see how your biochemistry looks. Uh, it's a very valuable experience in the sense that we don't carry little dials on our foreheads to tell us when we're getting low on something. And when we get symptoms, the symptoms very often are nonspecific. One symptom doesn't necessarily point to a specific deficiency. And so if, if you do get the chance to, to check your health, to check your levels, it can alert you to areas in your body that if they're corrected now, will prevent uh, future breakdowns. So it's almost like this is like the panel of your, of your uh, dashboard of your car, and these are like little instruments that are telling you where you stand and what you need to do to you know, get your oil checked or to uh, you know, have something done with the transmission fluid so that you don't have the big expense later. So I have just a quick little, just to kind of get us started, just a quick little um, PowerPoint up here. I think it's up, yeah. So this is our, uh, so we're, we're going to be doing this again. We do this every spring and fall. And it's a great chance to uh, use this information to look into the crystal ball, the biochemical crystal ball, and see kind of where you've been, how your life experiences has affected your reserves of your nutrients. And if one of your accounts is starting to run a little bit low, if the, if the gauge is starting to look a little bit like empty, that's the time to make uh, an intervention either in the form of uh, a supplement a multivitamin, a uh, dietary change, or a lifestyle change. So let's just do a couple of these just to kind of get a feel for how these are. Uh, for example, here's, here's vitamin A and beta carotene. Uh, for those of you that, that have this on your panel, uh, I, these are two very interesting tests to do for several reasons. Uh, I, what we've found over the years is that people who uh, are low in thyroid may have a uh, low vitamin A level but a fairly high beta carotene level like this particular person they're low on both A and beta carotene but one of the patterns that we see is where the the vitamin A is low but the beta carotene may be kind of high and so people say well why would that why would that uh, be that way and it turns out that vitamin I'm sorry, beta, beta carotene is two vitamin A's hooked together. It's two vitamin A's uh, linked, and you need adequate thyroid function to, to break that bond in order to separate it out and to have a, uh, an individualized vitamin A. And so someone who is low thyroid, they may, they may have plenty of beta carotene, especially if they're eating carrots or drinking carrot juice, they may have a really high beta carotene, but they're not converting it into vitamin A. Anyone find that on your results? Ah. <laughs> and the reason I think it's interesting, thyroid's one area of, that I'm very interested in because it seems like the, the thyroid gland is under attack. And I can, I can refer this question to, to Dr. Henshaw. Am I correct, Dr. Henshaw, in thinking that uh, all the environmental toxins, like things like uh, metals, mercury, lead, things like that, um, plastics and possibly some pesticides are affecting the thyroid gland in our time? Absolutely. That's it? <laughs> You're supposed to expound. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, I'm not going to expound specifically on that, but it's true that the thyroid is sensitive to all of these environmental toxins and exposures. And there are a couple of things that you left off the slide that oh. I think people might be interested in. Oh, yeah. Vitamin A would be skin and hair. Oh, yeah. And immunity, too. Yes, very, very much so. And also, the vitamin A, from my understanding, is made mostly in the cells of the GI tract. So it's, it's actually beta, it's made, vitamin A is made from beta carotene in the, GI in the cells line in the GI tract. So people with a lot of GI inflammation usually have low vitamin A, which then leads to low thyroid function, and other hormone problems. So that's a good. Very nice. Yeah. I'm learning, you know, you have to <laughs> learn something every day. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, another interesting thing about vitamin A that's just come out in recent, I think just this year, may, and maybe it's been known, but it's been in the nutritional news, is that vitamin A and vitamin D share the same receptor on the cell. 
So if you are, like a lot of us, paying more attention to your vitamin D levels and taking more vitamin D, you ought to be watching your vitamin A levels along with it because the two should balance out uh, in order to get the best effect. And I've had some people that I had unwittingly promised them that, hey, you're t you've got really good vitamin D levels, you're not going to get sick this year. And they did. And I was one of those people a couple of years ago. I was really getting onto the vitamin D bandwagon, but had not paid attention to A. And it turns out if you're going to take more D, make sure you're getting enough vitamin A to balance it out. Otherwise, you're going to create a relative deficiency of A. And A is very important in terms of immune functioning. Yeah. And the thing about ac um, skin that you were saying in GI, a lot of people that have acne, they always say, we'll work on your gastrointestinal tract and your digestion. But part of that is because vitamin A if you work on your GI tract, you increase your vitamin A levels, which helps acne. And that's what basically um, Accutane is, is vitamin A. Retin-A cream is vitamin A. And that's or, or a synthetic form. I'm, I'm sure there's other components of it. But it's, it's a, the base is vitamin A. So vitamin A is used a lot in the skin, especially for acne, adult acne, as well as um, acne of teenage years. And there's other causes too, zinc and stuff like that. But anyhow. Good. On this uh, cell receptor issue, I think that sometimes it's more important if you're overdosing on one of them to reduce the dose because you're actually saturating all the receptor sites. And once you've got that done, you can take a lot of both and it's just going to, I don't know where it goes, but it doesn't do any good. And uh, so I think a lot of times it's better to reduce the one that's too high while you're pushing up the one that's too low. But it, but it bespeaks the value of measuring because otherwise you might not know. Yeah. Absolutely. You yeah. might not know where you stand on that. So, Okay, any questions on beta carotene or, or vitamin A? You know, we're, in general, what I'm encouraging folks to think in terms of is not just beta, K, beta carotene, but the whole carotenoids. Mm -hmm. And so we find that um, things like uh, uh, the lycopene, the uh, uh, lutein, and then there's a new one, uh, astaxanthin, mm -hmm. is, is the new kid on the block that we don't measure, but uh, a lot of new research on the potency of that particular carotenoid. But again, they work together. They're, the, they're pigments, they're colorful pigments, and they're part of uh, what, what I call, the, or what, other, what another doctor called the color code that nature coded in a system for us to help us decide which foods are the best foods for us. And those are the ones that have the most color. And, and not m and M's. yes, <laughs> you're right. That's <clears throat> so, uh, so if you can get, if you can get highly colorful red, green, blue, purple uh, foods, uh, you are getting a lot of the carotenoids that way. Carotenoids in general, I think, tend to be orange, yellow, and, and uh, red. You might, you might mention while you're on that, what happens if you get too much beta carotene? Yeah, you can get uh, keratinosis. You can get actually kind of a orangish color to your skin, but usually that's another sign that your thyroid's not converting it into vitamin A. Or either that or you're just getting too much yeah, beta carotene. That happened carotene. to me when I lived on sweet potatoes in college. Sweet <laughs> you potatoes, eat yeah. sweet potatoes all the time. <clears throat> Yeah, <clears throat> sweet, sweet potatoes used to be, uh, this, is, this is a little factoid out of that book, uh, the color code, but sweet potatoes used to be thought of as a poor person's food. That was poor, that's why. If you, yeah, you were poor. <laughs> <laughs> you were poor. But it actually it turns out they did, they did an analysis of 50-some different vegetables looking at seven different nutrients. I forget what they were, calcium and fiber and probably beta carotene and different things, but it turned out the sweet potato was number one. It's a very nutrient-rich food. It also has a lower glycemic score. So if you had a choice between white potatoes and sweet potatoes, I mean, and you're not sensitive uh, to them, I, I think the sweet potatoes you're going to get actually more nutrition from. And it costs like 50 cents and fills you up. Yeah, it's a great, great way to go. All right. Well, we got a lot out of that slide. <laughs> hey. <clears throat> Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Low functioning no. thyroid, Low function. yeah, because your 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 thyroid is what's needed in order to break that bond 
just keep in mind that a beta carotene is two vitamin A's hooked together and that little bond has to be broken in order to get vitamin A. Mm -hmm. And so if your thyroid's not working very well, you're not going to you're not going to do that little task, that biochemical task mm -hmm. as well. So you're going to end up with a more more of the beta carotene and less of the vitamin A than what you would like. No, uh, that's why, that's, I think that was Dr. Hinshaw's point, is that you need to maybe do something to reduce your dose on the beta carotene. You could either, and that may not be a problem with your diet, it just may be that you need better thyroid functioning. And so that's where we get into other nutrients that affect the thyroid. Selenium is important in terms of normal thyroid functioning. Tyrosine is an amino acid your body needs in order to make thyroid hormone. You might want to be checked to make sure you don't have a metal toxicity, like too much uh, mercury or too much lead or something like that. Some people would say try to clean up your diet, use a little bit more of the organic foods and less foods that uh, could otherwise uh, be contaminated foods with pesticides. Don't microwave in plastic bags, or don't you know, or don't uh, you maybe cut down on your utilization of plastic containers because that can migrate into the food and the plastics can interfere with thyroid functioning. So there's a really a lot of things you can do and, you, and you, as you start to become aware that, you know, this is a clue and this is the value of measuring is now you have a clue that you know, you've got something going on with your thyroid. Now obviously you walked in and you look like you're in pretty good health so it's not something major but it's something that you can maybe start to make changes to avoid a problem that has not yet occurred. That's the beauty of nutritional testing is that you're predicting the future and doing something about it in a positive way to reduce your risk of having something adverse happen to you later on. Okay. Now we're on to another fat-soluble vitamin, I, and I'm very interested in the fat-soluble vitamins. To me, one of the reasons why I think we're seeing uh, a lot, of course, we're seeing a lot more research, uh, but we're finding out that, that these fat-soluble vitamins are very powerful in terms of preventing excessive inflammation. They're inflammation regulators. They, uh, vitamin D, of course, improves your calcium absorption, so it's good for your bones. Uh, you avoid SAD, seasonal affective disorder, if you have adequate amounts of vitamin D. This is why people during the winter months tend to maybe get sick more often because they don't get out in the sun as much. Their vitamin D levels go down. They don't feel as good. They drown their sorrows in sugar and sugary foods at Thanksgiving and Christmas and Valentine's Day. That's why this is the time of the year when the sugar really comes on strong and the sugar tends to weaken the immune system too. So all of these things set people up for flu and infe uh, infection, inflammation. And so vitamin D, it's turning out to be a great, a great preventive uh, vitamin uh, problem. And <clears throat> Could one of you kind of comment on how they sometimes they say it's not just a vitamin, it also has hormonal features? Right. And from my understanding, they call it a hormone because it, like other hormones, um, go through the cell and it affects the mitochondrial activity of the cell, right? So that's why it's considered a hormone. <clears throat> so it can actually. Um, What I'm trying to say. Well, I, my understanding is that it's almost like a transcription factor. Right. It affects the DNA, the mitochondria, the DNA the, replication. It's the DNA the going, and, and, and it can cause the nucleus <clears throat> of the cell to start to act and trigger inflammation. But by the same token, it can regulate it and stop it from occurring inappropriately. Yeah. And then also, it's fat soluble. So, like vitamin A, it needs to be taken. It's better absorbed if you take it with fat or with food of some sort. So, take it with your fish oil or. You know, so you'll absorb more of that supplement. You'll have higher absorption with that. I, I want to tell a little story. <laughs> um, recently I wrote an article about uh, flu shots. And some people now believe that flu is really a deficiency of vitamin D. Hmm. And this was all ferreted out by a doctor in England who was taking care of patients who were in a ward and his patients were all on high doses of vitamin D and everyone else wasn't and all the others got flu. 
except his patients. So that was the clue that got them into looking into the immune response to vitamin D. Yeah, it's, it's really, it's very interesting to kind of, you know, start thinking along that line because, you know, I think our, our, my upbringing was is that you catch the flu, right? You're, you're, you catch it from someone. And it kind of makes it, it's almost like it was that person's fault that you got sick or that you're a teacher and the kids gave it to you. And to me, what I like about the whole expanding uh, ideas around vitamin D and, and, and nutrition in general is that we're responsible for taking better care of ourselves. And if we get sick, we didn't catch it from someone. They didn't give it to us. We got it. We took it. We set up the conditions yeah. that allowed us to get sick. That inadvertently. Yeah. That's kind of like the idea with yeast and stuff, you know, um, you're creating the environment for yeast to grow. Same thing with bread. Yeast and mold doesn't just, you know, crawl on, it starts growing because the environment's there with oxygen and, you know, whatever, it just starts to grow. So that's a whole other thinking process with infections and viruses that you're not really catching them, but you're, uh, basically what you said, you're kind of. Yeah, and, and up, <laughs> until, up until maybe the last... 20, 30 years, uh, you really couldn't hold that idea very effectively because you had no way, I mean, you could try to super nutrition yourself by just eating everything and eating the right things and maybe taking a whole bunch of vitamins. But this is a little bit different. This is monitoring. This is where you're actually monitoring your nutrient levels and making a conscious decision to optimize the ones that are low, keep the ones that are good, keep those up, but in general, put yourself into a condition to where you are not as, at as high of a risk of getting these infectious diseases, degenerative diseases, you know, cancer is a degenerative disease, heart disease is a degenerative disease, and almost all of them have inflammation as an underlying component of it. Most of the medicines and most of the diseases that you hear about have the ITIS ending, whether you're talking about dermatitis, arthritis, colitis, they're all diseases of excessive inflammation. And what modulates inflammation, this was a big uh, revelation when I wrote this little book about five years ago on inflammation, is that inflammation is supposed to be our sentinel, our protector. And what's happened is we've gotten so far afield in the modern diet, our ancestors had a diet that was, they were hunter-gatherers, so they had a lot of uh, protein, you know, they were hunting, so they had a lot of protein, but they had a lot of vegetables in the forms of high fiber, low glycemic uh, vegetables, fruits, like the sweet potato, berries, we know they're, they're very healthy, uh, fibrous type things that helped our GI tracts to stay healthy. And so our ancestors really, they, they did pretty good uh, for not having hospitals or doctors or anything, but they, but they were getting very healthy foods. Now we have a diet that has totally shifted. It's a lot of it is packaged. It's way, way, way too high in, in refined sugars. Uh, the fats have been altered. We get, we're getting the wrong kinds of fats. We're, we've taken the fiber out of it, so it, it's uh, causing big swings in our blood sugar. More people are getting diabetes. And uh, we have the wrong, we have the, uh, a lack of omega-3 fatty acids in it. So as a result though, we're all shifted towards inflammation. Well, the beautiful thing about vitamin D is it can shift us back, balance us back out again, and make us less prone to these diseases of chronic inflammation. Yes, and um, one thing that I'm beginning to see is people are talking about vitamin D may be acting in conjunction with insulin, too, getting the sugar into the cells and taking care of the diabetes. So, Yes. Well. Oh, and another point here. Yes. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> well, Everything you're saying is beginning to show how the foot bone's connected to the leg bone and so forth. The, all of these things are interrelated. And you can't, if you just measure a single nutrient, you may get abnormal or normal, but remember how many other things there are. It's very important, I think, to do panels and, and broad numbers because you're just as likely yeah. to miss one, one as hit one. One single nutrient doesn't tell the story. No, it does not. Yeah. Hard to... Yeah. yeah, it's the, the new term that's coming on very strong now is the word epigenetics. You know, we know genetically we have a certain heritage that we've gotten from our parents, 
And in the past, the idea was, well, you're stuck. Well, if your parents had a certain disease process, well, you inherited that tendency, so you are stuck with it. But epigenetics says no. No, the, the more important thing, yes, we do have genetics, but those genetics are more like, a, they're like the hard drive of the computer. But the little things that we're tapping in on the keyboard in terms of the foods we're choosing to eat, the environment we're living in, the type of life we're creating for ourselves, the behaviors and the lifestyle, these have more important, they're more important to how the genes express than just the fact that the genes are there. And so we, there's a lot of research now being done on nutrients as gene modifiers. And so part of what we want to do is have optimal nutritional factors in order to keep the bad genes suppressed and let the good genes roll, you know, uh, that type of thing. Lutein and eye health. So we're now we're, everything that we've talked about so far has been fat soluble. So I, I remember uh, there's, a, there's a famous uh, nutritionist uh, from uh, Toronto who when she came down here and gave a lecture, someone was talking about or no, she, she made a comment about the dressing on the salad being fat-free, that that was not a good idea because all of your good phytonutrients are fat-soluble. So you actually want some oil on your salad in order to better absorb the phytonutrients that are present in your salad, especially if, for example, here we're talking about lutein, uh, the little baby spinach leaves are one of your best food sources for lutein. And so in order, but in order to absorb it, you might want to use some uh, olive oil or something that's kind of an anti-inflammatory good oil that you could put on your salad. Or use avocados or Avocados something in your like salad that. would be very good. Uh, nuts. Mm -hmm. uh, nuts Add are almonds. considered Nuts and almonds and walnuts. cashews, walnuts, they're all considered now health foods. Whereas in the past, people said, oh, no, I don't want to eat those nuts. They're too high in fat. You know, they're too fattening. And in nope. reality, fattened, becoming fattened is because your inflammation is out of control. And it's more has to do with insulin resistance and your body not handling blood sugar properly than it does fats. Unless you're going to a fast food place where they're using the wrong kinds of fats, like trans fats. These are fats that have been heated and they're hydrogenated. They're not as good for you. But if you're eating naturally occurring fats, this is what they found out with the Mediterranean diet is that those kinds of fats are actually very plant health fats. promotion. Plant hmm. fats, basically. Plant, plant fats are fats. very good. But even animal fats, there's a, my good friend Jack Chalam is coming out with a whole series of articles where he's been collecting new data on saturated fats. What we thought, we thought saturated fats were the bad guy and it turns out it's the company that saturated fats keeps that mm -hmm. makes them bad, not so much the saturated fats themselves. And the, the purer you can get your meats, the better the quality of your meats, the less likely that the saturated fats in those meats are going to cause right. you any Well, grass-fed beef doesn't have much saturated fat in it. That's right. It's mostly omega, well, it's, it's saturated in omega-3s. So we're back so to the hunter-gatherer. They when ate they, grass. When they hunted the animals, they were hunting animals that were eating grasses and leaves and all the things that they were eating, too. They were, you know, deer eat bark and leaves and various things. <laughs> So uh, they're getting their omegas from the plant sources. Yeah. yeah, I was, when I lived in Raleigh, we used to go feed the ducks. And I'm thinking, I wish we could do a study on the ducks, because all the bread, and there's these couples, these people feeding them Oreos and stuff. And I'm just wondering. Poor ducks. <laughs> you know. So, anyway. yeah. I just wonder what their health is like. It'd be a good study. <laughs> you can, by the way, you can look on your, uh, your results if you, if you happen to do the, the fatty acid panel and look at the omega-6 to 3 ratio in your own body fat by looking at the arachidonic to EPA ratio that's listed in your, in your, uh, your report. And uh, people, you want to have, now we, we, we allow as high as I think 12 to 1. But ideally, our ancestors were less than four to one mm -hmm. in terms of the amount of omega-3 to omega-6 that they were eating. But what's happened to us is our, we've shifted and we, we feed our animals corn. We feed them grains. And so the, the uh, animal fat content is no longer omega-3. Now it's mostly omega-6. And omega-6 is more pro-inflammatory. It's what's shifting that inflammation balance towards more inflammatory diseases. And this is what causes degenerative illness. Okay, so now we're going into lycopene. Uh, lycopene, 
I don't think, you know, I think we all are pretty much aware that uh, tomatoes are very rich in lycopene. Let me ask the audience a question just to wake everyone up. Uh, if you had a choice between a fresh tomato and tomato sauce, which one do you think would have the most lycopene? Sauce, 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 yeah. Very good, <laughs> got a sharp audience here. Yeah, because it concentrates as you, as you heat it and the water goes off, you know, you, you, uh, you concentrate the lycopene and it's not destroyed by mm -hmm. heating. And, it's, and it's, it's usually stuck to the fiber. So when you process really? it, it's, okay. it's coming off of the fiber. That's, how, that's, why, you, that's why processed tomatoes have, are higher in lycopene because it's more, it's more uh, available. Otherwise, it'd be stuck to the fiber of the tomato. Okay. From my understanding cool. of it. Would and it then always have oil because it's fat soluble. That's why tomato sauce is good because you, you should have oil. Olive oil. Don't use fat free tomato sauce. Th th this may be heretical, but if you watch some people's eating habits, you'd think that ketchup was their favorite vegetable. <laughs> 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 and that's not too bad if it doesn't have too much sugar, sugar. particularly fructose in it. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yep. And, and whoever, I can't remember the brand, but they, they have it written across their front now. Hunts. Hunts, Hunts is Hunts. fructose. No, no, fruit, no fruit, fruit, but no it still fructose. has a lot of sugar in it. Still has a There's lot no of sugar. high fructose corn syrup. Yeah, so it's a step in the right yeah, direction. It is. Yeah, soda pop is now moving back that way, too. I'm not, back I'm to not the in, new Coke? Yeah, I'm not in favor of soda pop anyway, but at least they're moving away from the fructose corn but syrup. That's how solids. they make it in Europe. That's all in my Mex friends from Europe they can't stand the American soda. In Mexico, different. they make all of their soda pop with sugar, and in Texas, you can buy Mexican Coke and Mexican, yeah, Mexican it Coke. Yeah, it tastes better. Yeah, it okay. does. It tastes better. Still too Not much sugar, but uh, nevertheless, there, you know, it's, it's the, the consumer public is making a difference. They do, they do listen. They're trying. Not very much. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so lycopene, it turns out, uh, is a very, very powerful antioxidant as well. All of these carotenoids are very powerful antioxidants. And antioxidants help kind of uh, referee inflammation and so if you can get good quality antioxidants you can help tone down your inflammation whatever it is and also we know that cancer cells like an environment that's inflamed or at least they proliferate in an inflamed environment so so most of the research that you all know you know we eat your fruits and vegetables to avoid cancer well the reason for that is because these these phytonutrients tend to turn down the fire, turn down the inflammation surrounding the cancer cells. And cancer cells really are just cells that have been injured. And so a lot of these nutrients actually come in and promote a healing process within those cells. So you're actually uh, promoting the healing of what uh, one of our researchers called the non-healing wound, which is what cancer cells are. They're a wound that hasn't healed. But you can take steps to either prevent that or to promote it to go ahead and possibly heal itself. I sometimes tell people we're in the business here of helping to induce spontaneous remissions in our cancer patients. <laughs> <clears throat> so you can check your lycopene level. You can either eat more red foods. Obviously the tomatoes, another good one would be what? What would be another lycopene containing food that's red? Peppers. Papaya, red Papaya. peppers. Watermelon. 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 Red grapefruits, yes. Yeah. Red peppers, yeah, very good. I don't know, are beets? I don't think so. They're I red, but know. I think they're due to, uh, that's a mineral in them that gives them that kind of magenta kind of color. But they're awfully good for your liver. Mm -hmm. Beets are, and they're very nutritious. Say so again, anything that's colorful, you're gonna, get, you're gonna get a really good nutritional hit from eating colorful foods. So add red peppers to your hummus. There's a lot of different mm -hmm. ways to. Mm -hmm. Red peppers are also the highest source of vitamins, one of the highest sources of vitamin C, too. Yep. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Doc, Dr. Hinshaw mentioned earlier about uh, vitamin D and, and blood sugar. Well, another nutrient that really is good for blood sugar is chromium. And so uh, your body uh, needs chromium in order to make the insulin work properly at the cell receptors. And, and it turns out that's where the problem is, is as people consume, over consume sugar, it's like uh, if you're in a really loud room, it's like your eardrums tighten up and you, you, you kind of block out some of that excess sound. Well, in a similar way, if you eat too much sugar, you'll downregulate many of your insulin receptors. And so you then tend to have higher blood sugar levels. So you feel like, okay, I need more sugar 
to kind of compensate for that and gets to be a vicious cycle. And most people who eat a lot of sugar don't get a lot of chromium in because they're not eating foods that have a lot of minerals. So right. that's a problem. Yeah, sugar itself is where you've stripped away everything else. If you could eat, if you could go down to uh, Cuba and actually chew on the sugar cane directly. You have it in Louisiana too. Do you? You have to go to Cuba. <laughs> yeah, I have it in Louisiana my backyard. Do you yeah. ever, have you ever chewed on sugar yeah, cane? Yeah, my family's sugar cane farmers. Oh really? yeah, I grew up with it. I didn't know that. It's, it's and it's and if you look in nature, the things that have the highest sugar content also have the higher highest fiber content. Sugar cane is a stick. It's literally like chewing on a stick. Beets as well. Beets have a high, high sugar. So in nature, when you're looking at things, you, the more sugar it has, the more fiber it has. So it reacts different in the body if you were to eat it in a natural form. But when you go and you extract it, not good. We're not meant to have. That we're meant to chew the sugar cane, and if you were chewing the sugar cane, you wouldn't have the same effect metabolic, but metabolically. What does it do to your teeth? That's a good question. There's probably stuff in it that in the stick that actually, or yeah. That's probably. interesting. It's it's a nutritious. It's a stick. It's yeah, you got to get an axe <laughs> to you got it, it, but it is sweet and it, it is have good. Vitamin C in it by chance? It might. Maybe we should do a study. I have a lot of sugar cane mm. down there. We can bring it okay. back up here and study it. I know a lab where we can analyze. You do? Where's that? Then close to here. Very close. <laughs> well, it's interesting that sugar is not considered to be a good guy, but yet as a species, we like sugar. We are, we gravitate towards sugar. But one of the things I tell patients is, is to try to eat your sugary things in the original package that it came in. And the reason for that is because, yes, it does have more fiber. And fiber will slow down the mm -hmm. rapid absorption of yep. sugar. So, and that's nothing, maybe you've heard of the glycemic index or the glycemic load. And all that's about is how fast does sugar go into your body from that particular food, how much of it goes in. And if it's got a high glycemic load, that means it's going in very rapidly, and that means that your body, in an effort to try to deal with that, will squirt out quite a bit more insulin. And so now, and if that happens time and time again every day, you are going to create insulin resistance. Uh, it's interesting that, back to soda pop, uh, Dr. Pepper, uh, nothing against Dr. Pepper or any company other than I think they're a little bit immoral about the amount of sugar that they're dumping on us as if it was good for us. But other than that, uh, <clears throat> that Dr. Pepper had a 10, 2, and 4 as their ad. Remember that? 10, 2, and 4? Because if people ate a real sugary breakfast, you know, have a cup of coffee and a donut, your blood sugar goes up. Let's say it was 8 o'clock. And so about 10 o'clock, your blood sugar is coming down like a roller coaster. So then you go have your morning Dr. Pepper, and that takes you back up until lunch when it's starting mm -hmm. to go back down again. So then right. you have your Coke and sandwich and ice cream or whatever malt. And so that now your sugar's back up again. And then about two o'clock it's down. So another Dr. Pepper up, four o'clock down. So you can see how people in the course mm -hmm. of the day are literally on a sugar roller coaster. And so what is mm -hmm. that we have an obesity epidemic and all the problems? Because now it used to be a little Dr. Pepper when I was growing up, yeah. it was like this, like eight or 10 ounces. And now you get the big gulp. Two, yeah. two liter. And I'll say another, I have to say this, sorry. But um, when I was in college, I took some food chemistry courses, and that's part of the reason why I'm in this field now. But there is more to soda than just the sugar. I mean, they're, they've paid chemists millions of dollars to figure out the exact sugar to caffeine to sodium ratio that makes that really makes you diuresis, and then you crave more fluid, and then you drink more soda. So there's it's a whole chemical reaction that goes on with soda so that's so it's not just the sugar content it's a lot of other things with soda that most yeah, people don't, aren't aware of, salt of. Soda pop. yeah there's a lot of sodium in soda pop and the caffeine that whole ratio but we could just drink effect. diet pop couldn't we wouldn't they just take care of it <laughs> yeah that, yeah <laughs> you don't want so to anyway, go there <laughs> that's why you crave more soda a lot when you're drinking it also drink phosphoric soda. acid phosphoric in. acid eats up your teeth and your gums. It takes pain stomach. off your car really well. The, too. the, the, the thing I was getting at with, with uh, NutraSweet, which is a, the diet pop, it's two amino acids hooked together. One of them is phenylalanine. And phenylalanine converts, you know what it converts into? <laughs> yes, there's a good Wait, I don't know. I might have the wrong answer. Dopamine? Formaldehyde, right? No, well, it does. Oh. But it, it can, if you let it out in the sun oh, and it heats up, it'll convert to dope, the right. uh, formaldehyde. But 
But the phenylalanine, the amino acid phenylalanine, is the next thing on the chain is dopamine. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So in a sense, it's a type of legal meth. Yeah, that is. <laughs> Diet pop, yeah. because I have a lot of people, including myself, That's aspartame. who was very, very addicted to diet pop. It's once you get it onto it. It's, now, a lot of people who don't drink it and they taste it, they say, oh my gosh, that doesn't even taste that good. But um, it, once you get addicted, it's, it tastes good. <laughs> yeah. We, we went to a lecture several years ago, and a guy was, was talking about the diet, and he'd written a book, and one thing he said about diet foods is just leave off the tea. <laughs> Very good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's true. Yep. I agree. Another point about chromium that people don't think about, and this is, I didn't realize it until I was doing a number of lectures on uh, insulin resistance, but another big problem with insulin re resistance, in, which occurs in diabetics or, or pre-diabetics, is not only are you having trouble getting your glucose into your cells, so your energy is low, you're tired, but also you have trouble getting your amino acids in. You need the insulin receptors and insulin to get amino acids into your cells. And so without that, you'll start to lose your muscle mass. And so people who are overweight are also, uh, they've got too much body fat, but they have a loss of muscle mass. And so they tend to be weak and tired. And then without muscles, you can't burn calories as well. And this is one of the reasons why getting overweight is such a trap because you're, you're putting on more fat, you're creating more insulin resistance, but you have less muscle to burn the calories that you're eating. That's why prevention's important. Yeah, you wanna stay ahead of this, and chromium, though, can be helpful. Another little side benefit of chromium, there's a whole book that we have upstairs, is chromium has been found to work as a natural antidepressant. And it may have to do with this whole thing about sugars and blood sugars fluctuating up and down. You can find out uh, now, whether or not you are pre-diabetic or diabetic by doing a hemoglobin A1C. And a hemoglobin A1C is where you are measuring your, uh, uh, what your last two and a half to three months blood sugar level has been. And uh, the American Diabetic Association in the past kind of, they weren't so sure about the hemoglobin A1C, but now they have embraced it because they find it's very hard to get people to come in and do a true fasting blood sugar. They, uh, they, 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 people are on the go so much. And so now they're saying, okay, just doctor, when the patient comes in for the regular appointment, have, a do, have them do a hemoglobin A1C, and at least you'll get an idea if they're moving towards that pre-diabetic or early type two diabetes state. The interesting thing about the hemoglobin A1C, I don't know if you know this, but it's based upon the fact that, that, sh that when you have high blood sugars, this, is a, this creates a lot of oxidation in the body and tends to stiffen different molecules in different parts of your cells. And so, in a sense, the hemoglobin A1C is a measurement of the stiffness of your hemoglobin. So what is it about getting old and stiff? That's, uh, that's why being diabetic will accelerate the aging process and it'll accelerate that stiffening that you feel as a result of uh, having uh, excessive oxidation of your cells. So, so hemoglobin A1C is also a good measurement just for, as a kind of a preventive measure of how well you're monitoring your diet and your intake. Yes, ma'am. How important is it to monitor your blood sugar level if you're pre-diabetic? I think it's very important in the sense that what monitoring does is that it keeps reminding you of what your goal is. I mean, our culture we live in a diabetogenic culture. In other words, all the cues on TV, uh, the, the fast food places that show the big hamburgers, and you know, everything in our culture wants us to consume more, more, more. And so for us to kind of withstand those cues, I think we need to have markers that tell us where we really are and hopefully help us make better decisions about what choices we're gonna be making in terms of our food. This, uh, as time wears on, maybe we better see if anyone has questions. We've been we've been talking yeah. here about. I'm, if you've got a test result or something you'd like to comment on, let's are hear we, it. Are we able to uh, just purchase a monitor, a blood sugar? Yeah, you can go uh, into a, a, a pharmacy, and if you if you want it to get some kind of insurance coverage, you you might want to have a prescription. But otherwise, it does not require a prescription for you to get a monitor and just check your own blood sugar levels. And then how often should you check, do you feel? 
Well, it depends upon what you're dealing with. If you've got, if you, if your blood sugar levels are running above 100 pretty consistently, and especially if they're above 125, if you're above 125, then you are type 2 diabetes. If you're between 199 and 126, that's pre-diabetes. And the American Diabetic Association set that number up to get people going, you know, because too many doctors were telling their patients, well, you're, you're borderline, don't worry about it. It's not that you should worry about it, but you should be willing to take action and monitor it is mm -hmm. what we're suggesting. And it's also good to <clears throat> do a two hour post meal so that you can kind of see how different your blood sugar reacts to different foods. So if you ate cake two hours post, see if it's back to normal or, and, and then do a chicken salad and see, and you'll learn there's a big difference in how your body reacts to the different foods. So it'd be a good experiment so you can kind of learn. Yeah, um, I'll, my, my last slide here, I don't know if it's in, maybe it's not here, but um, one of the slides I have is, you know, the best kind of health care reform you can engage in is self-care reform, where you're taking responsibility for yourself and making small baby step changes. You don't, I think it's, some people want to make the grand change, you know, but I think it's more realistic to just, as you learn things, start implementing them make them a part of your daily routine and then before you know it you've, you've, you've made some fairly significant changes in favor of better health. But uh, Dr. Hinshaw's point is good. Does anyone have a question about their results that they want us this, to kind this of... This lady in the red jacket had uh, yes, her hand up. Did you have your hand up for a question about your test results? Well, I, I'm, I just had a question. Now if you eat a nice meal with all the regular vitamins and everything and you follow it up with a with a sugary dessert does that cancel out everything it uh, the it helps and i think that's why traditionally <laughs> sugary desserts are put at the end of the meal because hopefully that nice meal that you ate is high in fiber because if it's got a lot of fiber then when you do eat the sugary stuff it's kind of like what dr kalmeyer was saying is that the fiber will tend to uh, smooth out. It'll it'll lower the gly glycemic effect of that high sugar dessert. And a, and a lot of times when I go over these results with people, and their fasting blood sugar is high, their triglycerides are high, I'll ask, "Well, how's your diet?" And they'll say, "Oh, I eat a great diet. Lots of fruits and vegetables. You know, lots of good fats." And then, but they forget to tell me, "Oh, but I do have five chocolate chip cookies after e every meal. You know, all those things." So. You know, it's good to eat really well, but you also need to, if your blood sugar is elevated, to stop, you know, to at least start decreasing some of the sweets during the day. Not everyone, but, you know, sometimes, or they'll snack on candies all day long, but all that can have an effect. Well, and also, even if you're eating you well. can do things like my wife has found recipes where you can make uh, uh, chocolate chip cookies that are oatmeal based with added right. fiber added oat bran and then you use the 100 the 70 percent dark chocolate chips and you reduce the sugar content mm -hmm. by half or, or or blend in some of the uh, alternative type sugars maybe a little stevia or or yeah. something like that you can do things to where you still enjoy those foods but being aware of the effects of sugar you can gradually yeah. modify how you eat in such a way that it doesn't affect you quite so much. Uh, Jennifer and Ron, what would you think about advising people to buy glucose rather than table sugar? Interesting. Like um, rice like ri uh, rice brand sweeteners, things like that, that are in a lot of bars is glucose rather than Glucose sucrose. is really utilized for energy almost instantly. Instantly, mm -hmm. yeah. I would good prefer idea. that. I haven't tried it. Uh, can't you, you can also get things like coconut sugar mm -hmm. and some of these right. natural, natural f derived like, type sugars. Like those bar, the new bars that we have up there for glucose control is mainly the sugar in it is glucose. glucose. It's rice bran sweetener, so there's no high fructose corn syrup. There's no fructose in it. There's no cane sugar, yeah. anything. But that would be a better option for blood sugar control. Ta table sugar is half fructose and half sucrose, uh, half glucose. And it's the glucose that your body uses for energy. When, so when you go from fructose to sucrose, you've cut your uh, fructose intake in half. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you can buy glucose in the health food stores and just eliminate the fructose and then you're left with a sugar that's very readily absorbed and a uh, very high percent of it will be used immediately for energy burned up 
uh, have less effect on the insulin and um, uh, less uh, storage as fat, less conversion to fat. I've got, any, if there's any other questions, just stop me. I'm going to quickly go through the last three slides here. We talked already about the omega-3, the EPA to DHA ratio, total omega-3. Uh, that's not, yeah, that, I don't know, if, that's just your total omega-3. It's EPA and DHA. And so these are the good omegas that you want. Uh, they tend to occur in the wild. And one of the reasons why fish is being emphasized is it's one of the few remaining sources of wild meat uh, or protein that we can get. And even that is diminishing rapidly as more and more fish farming is being done. So, but nevertheless, you can use supplements in this area to get your total omega-3 count up and it will do a lot of good things in terms of modulating uh, inflammation. It has a slight blood thinning effect. It's very good for cognitive functioning. Uh, we use it for bipolar disorder and uh, kids with attention deficit problems. DHA is very important in terms of vision. So there's a lot of, way, a lot of ways you can benefit from omega-3. And then the C-reactive protein is a good way for you to kind of get a handle on how much hidden inflammation do I have because you don't necessarily feel inflammation. If you have it localized, you'll feel it but if it's just systemically spread in a chronic way throughout your body, like this person has a C-reactive protein of six, so that's way up into the red, there's something causing it. It could be an infection, but it could also be this nonspecific uh, chronic inflammation that's due to the uh, imbalance in the nutrients. And so that's something that could be modified with uh, omegas, vitamin D, uh, eating the right kinds of foods, cutting down on sugar and reducing your insulin resistance. Lipoprotein A is kind of a special type of cholesterol. Um, it's, it's there as a kind of a heart disease marker. Uh, it, it, it may be present uh, as a sign that you're, you're at a little higher risk for heart disease. Uh, Dr. Linus Pauling thought it was a marker for that you were not getting enough vitamin C and that what was happening is that uh, the, the play, you know, he, he used to ask the question, why, why don't goats get heart attack, get a heart attacks? Well, they make their own vitamin C. Why do people get heart attacks and strokes? Why don't we get a left hand attack or a left foot attack? And the, and the reason is, is that when the heart beats 100,000 times a day, did you know that? 100,000 times a day, your, your friendly heart has been doing this since you were born. Uh, Every time it beats, it pumps that blood out and the, the, the impact, the highest, I guess you'd say, hemodynamic stress is right at the opening where the, uh, the aorta and the coronary arteries and the carotid arteries are the arteries that take the most stretching 100,000 times a day. So they're more, most likely to have some wear and tear, like little tears or little injuries occurring in the lining of those arteries. So, if you have vitamin C and the nutrients to make collagen and, the, and adequate endothelial progenitor cells, your body will go in and repair those little tears. If you lack those nutrients and the body doesn't have that, it knows that if those vessels blow, you're in big trouble. So it's gonna do what it can to put some kind of a patch over those tears, those injuries. And lipoprotein A is that patch. So when people have high amounts of lipoprotein A, you can interpret it that, well, okay, you, uh, you're in danger. It's a heart disease risk. I would say, you know, your body's been doing what it's meant to do to keep, your, keep you alive, but the, the real answer is you haven't had enough of the, the nutrients that your body needs to do the repair work. So that's when we start putting, we have something up front there uh, called Cardiorite, which has uh, vitamin C, it has all the vitamins in it, it has the B vitamins and everything, but it also has something that most vitamins don't have, which is lysine and proline. And your body needs lysine and proline in order to make good, strong collagen. So that's why we use Cardiorite for people that have heart, heart conditions, so they can go ahead and do the repair work. So I think any questions or comments on that? I think we're just about out of time here. Uh, hopefully we haven't rambled on too much. <laughs> Uh, it's just kind of just trying to giving you an overview of how
nutrition can serve you in terms of, uh, by knowing what your levels are, you can make decisions that will protect you from future consequences by giving you a head start on intervening and uh, helping your body heal itself. So that's what today is. Any final words, final questions or comments from up here? Going once, going twice. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Bromelain. I've been told um, by a practitioner that I consult that bromelain is a good anti-inflammatory um, medication derived from pineapple that is natural. The real thing I was wondering is if you can take bromelain without the GI irritant side effects that are uh, accompanying most of the other I'm going to let Dr. Kallmeyer handle that. Yeah, bromelain won't, are you asking if bromelain causes GI irritation like at, like ibuprofen and uh, things like, no, it does not. It will not have the same effect. So if someone were taking an anticoagulant, 